Well, happy Father's Day. So glad that you're here with us. Uh, it's uh, the brave coming out and being part of our service. If you're joining us online, so glad that you're, uh, you're with us, you're joining us. I know that many of you are still at home or wherever you're at to kind of keep that extreme social distancing. And, we're, and I just want to say happy Father's Day to you as well, to those men who are uh, joining us. Uh, since it is Father's Day, I wanted just to do a quick survey, just to kind of get a, a, a feel for, this, for the room here. And then we're also going to be doing uh, the same thing for, uh, for those of you who are online. We have a gift here for you, and then we have, a, I think, uh, it's a gift certificate uh, for those of you online. So uh, if you, uh, who here is the, has the youngest, is the newest father, the youngest kid? So who here is a new, is anybody a new father? Let me see. How about if you have a kid? who's uh, in uh, a preschool. There we go, right here. Okay, so here we got, it's actually a really cool gift. Yours is a, if you're online, you put it in, te- in chat, they're going to figure out who's got the youngest dad. We've got a gift certificate to Lowe's. You got a gift certificate, you got a gift. That's actually, we ordered that. It's a quality hammer that's engraved with uh, about building the kingdom of God with, and, and so every time you're building something, you can think about that, you know. So that's cool. And then we have uh, one more. It's for the father with the most kids. Okay, so the most kids, that's, that's worthy of like celebrating, right? You, you got a lot of kids. So if you have uh, like, like, let me see, if you have three kids or more. Okay, if you have four kids or more. No? Did I miss one? No? Three kids. All right, well... Uh, we have one hammer, so you're going to have to choose somebody, if you don't mind. So you can keep your hands up. If you have, what is it, three kids or more? Uh, hey, listen, regardless of whether you got something or not, we just wanted to highlight, we admire you guys. We love you. It's Fathering is not easy. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And so uh, we want to just talk about, hey, how can you be an effective father? You know, some of you are, fa- you're, you know, fathering is a season of life, and you might have, uh, you might not be a father yet, you might have uh, young kids, kids have already gone out of the house, you might have youth, you might have adopted kids, you might have stepkids, and then of course there's spiritual fathers. We're going to look at uh, a spiritual father today, and how he didn't have kids of his own biologically, but he had uh, he had spiritual kids. He was influencing. He was mentoring people. And you know, that's something really we all can step into, no matter what your age, you can step in and to do that. And so we're going to talk about that uh, real briefly today. I want to tell you about um, something that happened to me this week. I, well, actually, I have to back up like five, six years ago. Sharon and I, uh, we decided, we were at Costco, we decided they had uh, some fruit trees, and we decided to get a couple fruit trees. Well, I love cherries, so I said, hey, let's get two cherry trees. So we get some cherry trees, we plant them in our backyard. I'm all excited. I know I'm not getting fruit the first year. You know, I'm not dumb. I'm thinking, well, you know, you got to wait a year, maybe even two. So I wait the second year, no cherry trees. Go out the third year, no cherries. I'm like, I'm getting angry. I'm thinking, what's up with this, you know? And then now it's been five or six years, no cherries on either tree. Now, one tree seems to be doing well. He's growing up, he's getting real big, real fluffy, still no fruit. The other one's like, he's not doing well at all. And here's my, so here's the one, this is me, this is this week. This is, he's doing, it's doing great, it's a great looking tree, right? I'm thinking, hey, that's a cool tree. Here's the scrawny one. I'm like, I've got the sad face going because, you know, it's just like, you know, there's something wrong with him. He's right next to the other tree. I don't know what the problem is. There shouldn't, bees don't get that confused, you know. I mean, they can figure out how to pollinize. So I'm just, I'm frustrated. In fact, I go to the Bible and I see Jesus telling a story about something, it resonated with me, put it that way. Jesus says, I've waited three years, and he's talking about, he's telling a story and this is somebody else talking. I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Okay, no, I don't have a fig tree, I have a cherry tree, but that's how I feel, right? Why bother with it any longer? It takes up space we can use for something else. That's, so I'm, this is going in my mind the last few years. Like, okay, tree, you better produce something soon. Or you're out of here. You're just taking up space. 
So in this story, Jesus tells the uh, gardener, says, give me one more chance, leave it another year. I'll give it some special attention, give it some fertilizer. Then if you, there's no figs, whoosh, cut it down. So I'm thinking, and this tree's already, I mean, this Jesus is talking about, you know, here three, four years. Mine's gone five, maybe six. I'm like, okay, tree, you're going down. So anyways, that's my, that's where I'm at. Okay, so this week, I decide, Sharon's got a, you know, beautiful garden. She's really into that. So I, I download uh, this app called Snap Plant. And all it does is you take a picture of the flower or a leaf, or, and it tells you what kind of plant it is. So I download this, this app. I'm going around to her different flowers, you know, her, her adrangia, and I'm taking a scene, you know, ve- you know verifying it. And it's, the app's working great. So I'm, I'm saving these photos. And so I, when Sharon... Uh, I see her later on. I say, hey, I want to show you something. I take her out to the yard. I say, look at this. Uh, look at this plant. And she, well, she already knew what all the plants were. For me, they were just like flowers. I was trying to figure out what are they called. And so there wasn't a lot of surprises for her. And I'm saying, hey, look at that. See that? I found this one. So I, uh, so I did my tree as well. And uh, it came up European dwarf cherries. I didn't know. It was, I just, it was a cherry tree. But it comes up European dwarf cherry. So she was sharing that. I said, and I took a picture of that leaf. And this is what it came up. She goes, well, and that was the big tree. She goes, well, take a picture of, of the small tree. I said, why would I do that? I mean, they're the same. She goes, I don't know. Just humor me. Do it. So I do it. It does not come up that. It comes up a plum tree. I'm thinking, whoa, I got something happened bad, you know. I got duped. I got tricked. I don't know if it was like. You know, from the manufacturers, or that they didn't put them out right, or I grabbed the wrong ones. I don't, all I know is I'm stuck now with two trees, five, six years into it, no fruit. And I'm, and I, but it, the frustrations now change, right? I'm thinking, well, it's not the tree's fault. I was like all upset at the tree. Trees, you're going down. So I've now made peace with my trees. I'm happy with them. It's not their fault. And I'm thinking of new ways to make them fruitful because that's the ultimate goal. I bought them so they would produce fruit. And so I'm thinking, well, maybe I'll just get another cherry tree, get a plum tree. I'm not a huge plum fan, but, you know, and, uh, and then fruitfulness should happen after that. Well, fruitfulness is the goal that God has for us. He wants us to be fruitful. In our church, we call that making a difference. God wants you to make a difference with your life. And if to make a difference means you have to produce fruit. It's frustrating when we don't produce fruit. Sometimes we're trying to figure out, how did this happen? Why am I not very productive? Why am I not very fruitful? And the fruit that God wants us to produce is fruit that lasts and lasts. Eternity. He wants our fruitfulness to be, he wants us to have the big picture. And so that's not easy to do. But I want to take this Father's Day to kind of talk about that. Now, certainly the things we're going to talk about equally apply to women. But because it's Father's Day, I wanted to kind of focus in on the fathers, on the men of our church, and talk about, hey, how can I be a better father? Now, there's a couple fathers, as I said. In uh, Well, Paul's the father. He's kind of a spiritual father of Timothy. And so he calls him his son a number of times. He's not his, his biological son. But here's what he says about Timothy. I love this. Timothy is actually lives in Ephesus. When Paul writes this, he is in Rome. He's in a Roman prison. And he says this, I've got nobody else like him. He's talking about Timothy. He goes, I've got nobody else like this guy. I mean, what a, what a great thing to say about somebody. It also is an indictment. Where is all the other guys, you know? But he's saying, hey, this guy's unique. We'll look at why. He says, you should hold men like him in highest honor. He's talking about a different guy. This guy's Epaphroditus. He, this guy does not live in Ephesus like Timothy. He lives in Philippi. So Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey, and uh, Philippi is in uh, modern-day Greece. And so he, that's where he lives. He says, in a different translation, he says, esteem him highly for people like him deserve it. Why does he deserve it? Well, he's fruitful. He may, he's making a difference with his life. And the, when we look at these two guys, we see traits that they have, things that make them fruitful, make them in a place where they're really contributing and changing the world around them. And so as we go through this, I want you to kind of uh, make a checklist. How are you doing? Is there, there's probably a couple areas you're really strong at, maybe an area or two you could work on, and that would be my Father's Day prayer for you, is that you would step into that and say, I'm going to get better in this area that I'm not so good at. Number one, 
Let's look at this. The, first, we're going to look at Timothy, then we'll look at Epaphroditus. We see compassion in Timothy's life. This is how Paul describes him. He, call, he refers to him as this man who had a heart for others, had, uh, was relationally oriented. And sometimes that's hard, particularly for men, right? Sometimes we can be results-oriented. It's all about the results. And so he says, no, what, what made this guy fruitful, with how he made a difference was he didn't igno- it's not that he ignored results, he just, it wasn't results over, over relationships. It wasn't profits over people. He said, no, people play an important role. Here's what he says. He goes, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him, talking about Timothy, who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. That's what I wanted you to focus. See, there's where he's talking about he cares about the person, you know, looking past the problem, the complaint, the anger, the things that people do, they're reflecting something that's going on inside them. Now, that's hard to do. Some people are better at that than others. Uh, that's an area I struggle in. I have to kind of be prayerful when I'm talking about talking with somebody, especially if I'm, you know, sleep deprived or there's conflict going on. Wrong. There's a lot of things that can go into, you know, I have low blood sugar and I get, I get, I, I get, thin-skinned. It's just harder to do that. So it takes more effort sometimes, right? Some of us, it takes more effort to have a genuine interest in somebody else's welfare. He goes, but that's what Timothy had. For everyone else looks for his own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people that are thinking about themselves, their own interest, not the things of Christ. And it's the things of Christ that cause us to be concerned about the things of other people. Listen, we're all naturally selfish. Sharon and I, we've been married over three decades, and it it would be wrong and dishonest for me to tell you it's all been easy, no problems. If it hasn't been easy for you, you've been married for a long time, then you just married the wrong person, sucks to be you, sorry about that. No, that wouldn't be true. The truth is, it's been, we've had some great times, but we've also had some very difficult times. And why? Because when Sharon and I got married, we, there was two very selfish people that came together. That makes, that makes for an interesting relationship. And the truth is, that's all of us, right? When we come together, it's just two selfish people trying to get their own way. And so the more we can learn how to put other people's interests first in our marriage, with our kids, caring about our kids, at work, all the different relationships we have, the more we can get along. If you're always looking for, well, I'm only going to do uh, and comp- you know, com- comparable to what they do, tit for tat, that's a miserable way to live. This is about, hey, what's, it's not about me, it's about you, I want to help you, I'm concerned about you. Look at this, uh, different translation, it is loyal, Timothy's loyal and genuinely concerned for you. Most people around here are looking out for themselves with little concern for other, for things that Jesus is concerned about. And so learning to be others oriented. Now, look look at this verse. It says, they are all wrapped up in their own affairs. If you're a man and you're all wrapped up in your own stuff, you're really not a daddy, you're a mummy. That's kind of dumb, huh? Okay. See, you know what? I was hoping, nobody laughed at the last service. I was thinking, well, it's just too early. But it just turns out it's a crappy joke. So, so but that's good. It's awareness. I'm growing. I'm on a growth curve. You know, it's interesting with, with uh, in another culture in Asia, they have Asian elephants. They're different than African elephants. Asian elephants, the tradition they've had back in the day of breaking the will in a, of an elephant so that it would obey its master is they would take these elephants. Now, pachyderms are very social animals. So they would take the elephant and they would isolate him from their, from their pack. And they, would, and they would put him for three days in isolation. Well, that was, that was so difficult for an elephant because they're so social. So it was, it was just, you know, this isolation, this loneliness, uh, relational uh, isolation. And by the end of the three days, the elephant was an emotional mess. Then they would release the elephant out of isolation at night. And they would have fires all around. And they would, the elephant would come into the circle filled with a ring of fire. And then people would be yelling at the elephant, screaming at the elephant. We well, would just break the elephant's will so much so that it would do whatever their master asked from then on. And you go, why are you telling me this cruel story? Well, I think that's how many youth feel. Young people, 
in homes today often are, feel very isolated, very lonely, not connected in with their family. And so they, 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 they have this, they get broken down inside. And then the world and peer pressure starts screaming at them. And then no wonder they fall into what the world has to offer and they go in that direction. And so God has an answer. And his answer is, is that he wants people to come alongside. And, and as I said, fathers, they were talking about fathers. Fathers, you play an important role. You play an important role to help with uh, people that are in difficult places. That's, that's my elephant. So let me give you some, some guidelines, okay, as a father. When a father does not admit that he's wrong, some people have a hard time with that, right? His children lose confidence in his leadership. When a father is too strict in discipline, and sometimes we use the excuse, well, that's the way my dad did it. Well, that doesn't make it right. His children have their spirits broken, like that elephant. When a father gives too much freedom, doesn't really care what they do, his children begin to see that freedom more as a form of rejection. In other words, you don't even care if I get hurt. You don't care if I end up on drugs. You don't care if I end up in jail. When a father neglects God's word, his children reject the authority of God and the authority of the Bible. We play an important barometer in, 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 in that. When a father disciplines his in anger, his children become embittered. The Bible tells us when a father is impatient with his children, his children seek approval from their friends. And so we play a vital role. Uh, parents play a vital role, but in particular fathers, and we want to lead with compassion. So not only compassion, but also character. God has a high value on character. The world has a high value on image. It's all about image. Pro, you know, you project the right image. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter what's going on uh, behind the scenes. And so, but, but character, God says, no, that is important. And we see this again in Timothy. But you know that Timothy has proved himself. That's a key word there. Because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. So that's not his biological son, but it's his spiritual son. He's mentored him. He's poured into him. And he says, I've seen his life. He has proved, proved character. So the next, it says proved, that word literally means tested character. That's what it means. That in other words, I've watched. This is something that grows over time. I've seen him in, in hot water. I've seen him in difficult places. And, and what comes out is character. He's not perfect. And we're not talking about perfection here, right? We're talking about we're going to become more fruitful. We don't want to be non-fruitful. We want to be more fruitful. We're looking at some areas in our lives that we can certainly grow in. And Timothy had that. He said, now when Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, a man of character, here's what he said. He said, what kind of man did you expect to see out in the wilderness? He's talking about John the Baptist. Did you expect to see a man who would be easily influenced and shaken by the shifting opinions of others? That's a great definition of what character is not. You know, easily influenced and shaken by the shifting opinions of other people. And so that's not character. That's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to step in to a character that's motivated by what we believe, conviction. Conv character is best defined as conviction. Because when it comes to an opinion, you'll just argue about that. But if it's a conviction, that's something people die for. And the people that had the greatest influence over time and throughout history were not the people that were the wealthiest, not people that uh, were the most good looking, had the greatest education. No, the people that had the greatest influence, good or bad, for good or for bad, were people that had the most conviction. They had conviction about what they, what they, what they, what they believe. The one who walks in integrity will experience a fearless confidence in life. That's God's desire for you, to have a fearless confidence no matter what you face. You go into uh, a new school, fearless confidence. You go into a new job, fearless confidence. You go into a testing situation, confidence. You go into retirement, fearless confidence. You go into the doctor's office, fearless confidence. God wants that. You know, it's interesting that Will was... A number of times earlier in the worship set, he, God was moving on him. I don't remember him doing that earlier, but he's, hey, you know, God's doing something against some fear. Some of us, we struggle deeply with fear. And so God wants to work that fear out of your life. If you have that, here's somebody who had, he, he had terrible uh, 
character in his life. It says, it's Pilate. Pilate took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. This is Jesus now being, un, he's having an unjust trial, unjust treatment. Here he is. He has the power to do something. He washes his hand. He had the power to do something. He goes, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Baloney, baloney. He said, it is your responsibility. And so here's a person of no character, really not making a big difference at all. And it's, it's a sad situation. You know, the Bible says that we have responsibility in our own home, especially as fathers. As fathers, you influence your home in a great way. You know, Lot and Abraham, Abraham's the father of our faith. Abraham's nephew was Lot. They were both shep- sh- shepherders. And so they had lots and lots of flocks. They were both very wealthy. Abraham says, you know what? It's not working out because you have so- we both have so many animals. We don't, there's, the fields are not big enough. We need to split up. So he lets Lot choose where he's going to go. And he takes him up to a mountain, and Lot chooses this place that's just beautiful. Lots of greenery, all that. What happens to be of the place called Sodom. And you remember Sodom and Gomorrah. So God's judgment is going to come down on that place because of their wickedness. Well, he doesn't know all that. He just likes the place. So he goes down into Sodom. And the tragedy of that story is that he takes his family there, but when he leaves... Most of his family doesn't come with him. His family stays there when God's judgment comes. And so many times that midlife crisis come into a man's life, they'll bring the world into their home. And they think it's private sin or whatever, but they bring the world into their home and some of the evils of the world. and, and And then they wake up. They come out of it, but their family doesn't. Their family's often harmed or ruined because of it. We play an important role as fathers in our home. There's a spiritual protection over the household when a father lives a godly life. As I said, not a perfect life. I certainly am not perfect, but a godly life. And when we make mistakes, we own up to it. We repent. We get the help we need. We're in small groups to help us get the support we need. We don't just try to wing in and do it on our own. That really brings me to this next, the next character trait we see. Oops. And that's cooperation. Cooperation. There we go. Cooperation. Here we see, he's now talking to Epaphroditus. So Timothy lived in Ephesus. Those are the first two character traits. The other three we see from Epaphroditus, he lives in Philippi. He says, I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things are go with me. I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. And now here's three things he says about Epaphroditus. My brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. So the backdrop here for this story is, is that uh, there's this guy, uh, his name is Epaphroditus, and they're going to take up an offering for him, uh, for Paul, because that's, he's in a Roman prison, and that's how you get cared for, was by people in your community. And so they, they go to him, and, 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 he's, and he's talking about uh, some traits of him. Now, we'll look at that in just a moment, but here he says, He goes, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier. Important traits on how we get along with one another. Three things he points out. First is there's a common bond. We share a common bond in Christ. Actually, the bond we share is often bigger and and, and deeper than a blood bond, maybe a relative, even your own brother or sister. It could be stronger than a race. the bond we have in Christ is huge. In, in the New Testament, the word brother referring to uh, a Christ follower, a fellow Christ follower, is used 133 times. That's used more than almost any other phrase to refer to uh, our relationship together. There's a bond. Some of you were raised in a tradition, a, a, a denomination where that was commonly used. You'd say, oh, brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. That's actually a great term. It really reflects this bond that we have uh, in Christ. And he says, not only do we have the same bond, but we have the same mission. He says, we, we're on the same, uh, we're both, we're workers for Christ. We're all on the same mission of helping people find Christ and get discipled. To, to be, in our church, what we talk about is, is that they get to know God, they find freedom, and then they discover their purpose. Ultimately, they're going to make a difference and be fruitful. And so we share the same mission. The word he uses, their worker, is 
synergio, it's, where the, it's a Greek word where we get our word synergy from. Synergy means the joint action of work that when taken together increase each other's effectiveness. In other words, the Bible says one can chase a thousand, two can chase, not two thousand, but ten thousand. It's actually a true, it's, it's, it's absolutely true. In other words, through cooperative work, we produce more. Now, it is teamwork. It's not pl- team play, right? Teamwork is hard. It does not make it easier. It makes, the, it makes our output more effective. It's actually more difficult. It's harder to achieve consensus in teamwork. When you're in teamwork, you have conflicts that arise that wouldn't have arised if you weren't working in cooperation with one another. So it can be challenging, but the results are worth it. And then a shared enemy. We share the same enemy, which is Satan. The devil is after you to kill, destroy, steal things out of your life. He doesn't want you blessed. He doesn't want you uh, having, uh, being fruitful, having fruitfulness in your home, in your, in your ministry, in your work, or any of that stuff. And so the truth is we need one another. We need one another. You are not going to make it alone in Christ. When he says fellow soldier, I love this verse. He says, so all of the men in Israel got together, united as one man. And so they had greater effectiveness because they were united as one person. When we're united together, uh, great things can take place. Teamwork does not make the work easier, but the results are bigger and better. Bigger and better. And we need that, certainly. Then commitment. Commitment is a high value. That's, if we're going to be fruitful... For God, if we're going to make a difference, we've got to have this area of commitment. So here it is, uh, Epaphroditus, again, he's in Philippi, but I think it is necessary to send back to Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, so we just looked at that, who is also the messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. So he's in prison, Paul's in prison, and they're going to send Epaphroditus, the church in Philippi took an offering, and they, they were, hey, we're going to send Epaphroditus. They needed a courier to sit to take this offering. Uh, for he longs for you all and is distressed because you have heard that he was ill. Now, he gets sick on the way. But just the, just, just the traveling alone is pretty remarkable. They take this offering in Philippi. It's for Paul, who's in Rome. That's 800 miles away. And they didn't have trains. They didn't have automobiles. They didn't have airplanes. He walked that one. And he might have taken a boat a little ways, but most of it's walking. And maybe he, he rented somebody's donkey. I don't know. Either way, 800 miles is a haul. What if I were to go to one of you and say, hey, we took up an offering for a church in New York. Would you please go and take it there, but you can only either walk or take a donkey? You'd probably think, Andy, are you sure? I mean, that's, yeah, it's got to take a donkey or walk it to New York. And New York's only half the way. That's only 400 miles. This is 800 miles. And when he goes, he gets sick. In fact, he gets very sick says, indeed, he was ill almost to death. That word ill is the same word that's used when Lazarus, who does die, and Dorcas, who does die. And so it's, it's, maybe it's like COVID-19, I don't know. But it's something that t- almost takes him out. And he's traveling on this long. Have you ever been traveling and gotten really sick? I mean, if you have, you know how miserable that is. It's hard enough to be sick. But when you're traveling, it's just like miserable. All you think is, I, I want to be home. I want to be home in my own bed, just my own surroundings. It doesn't matter how nice of a hotel you're in. If you're sick, that hotel's no, not all that good. You just, and, but Epaphroditus, he doesn't turn around. He had a great excuse. He could have gone back, and everybody would have understood. But he's a man of perseverance. He's a man of commitment. He pushes through this difficulty in order to get this offering to Paul, who's in prison. That's remarkable. That's remarkable. And he says that, uh, he goes, God had mercy on him. So Paul's so thankful because he, w- he didn't want to feel bad about somebody dying, just trying to help him out, and God protects him. But regardless, that is part of the reason uh, we're looking at Epaphroditus because he is making a difference with his life, but it took incredible perseverance and commitment. In 1942, Winston Churchill was giving a major wartime speech at Herod's Men's College. And they told all these guys, they said, hey, Winston Churchill, the prime minister of England, is going to come in. He's going to give a major speech. Make sure and take notes. Everybody had a pad and a paper and, and, a, and a, a pencil. They were ready to take notes. It's packed, standing room only. Winston Churchill, he comes in, and here is his speech. He goes, gentlemen, never give up. Never give up. 
Never, never, never give up. And then he walked away. That's his speech. It's easy to remember. That's God's word for some of you because you're in a difficult place in your life. You're with your kids, with your marriage, with a, a key relationship with maybe your, one of your parents or somebody, uh, maybe at work. And the, all there's something in us that wants to retreat sometimes when we just want to say, this is too hard. It's like Epaphroditus. He's alone. He's on this long route. He's walking. He's huffing it. He gets sick on top of that. 800 miles, day after day. I mean, it takes incredible fortitude to say, I will not give up. I will not give up. And God's saying that to some of you. Never give up. Then you need courage. Which Courage, we all need that. Particularly in our weak zones. All of us has areas that we're strong on. You know, oh yeah. You know, you'll hear some people, you know, uh, oh yeah, I don't have any problem with snakes. It's spiders. Other people, yeah, spiders don't bother me. Snakes don't bother me. It's bees. I mean, everybody's, and the truth is we all have weaknesses. And one of the weaknesses that is common for all of us is our kids. Satan would love to come and attack our children. And that is an area we often need the most level of courage in. Trusting in God's promises, even when things look so bleak and so difficult. And so God says, I want you to have courage. Now, certainly, Epaphroditus said that. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send Epaphroditus, so that when you see him again, you may be glad. And I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy. And honor a man like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking Risking his life, that word is like hazarding. In other words, he was willing to lay it all on the line. We're looking hindsight, we know he lived. He didn't know that. He was willing to lay it all on the line. He was willing to take that great adventure. He was, and it's because it's rooted in commitment. He's, he, he loves God and he wants to make a difference. And his life made up for the help you could not give me. I think of Frederick Douglass, who was dur lived during the... Uh, abolitionist movement and and with fighting for freedom he had to he bought his own freedom and then he started his own publication the north star and worked tirelessly to right the wrongs of his day the injustice working towards helping people be freed and uh it was took incredible courage he had all kinds of death threats all kinds of things coming at him it took courage to do that he's one of my heroes amazing autobiography that he wrote, but it takes courage. Jesus said this, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? There's a lot of people chasing things that the world has to offer. And every day we make choices of what we're going to chase, of what we're going to go after, well, how we're going to spend our time. Every time you make a choice on, how, on, on anything, any decision you make, any time you make a choice on how you're going to spend your time, that is a spiritual thing. The most spiritual thing you do every day is when you make a decision. Because every decision roots back to how am I spending my life? Am I going to invest it in something that's going to outlast it? Am I going to go for fruitfulness? Or am I going to let the world influence me? Let them influence me? And listen, there's a lot of people that have opinions for your life, but God has an assignment. He has an assignment that's filled with adventure, filled with, but it's going to take risk. Anything that, that you're going to do worthwhile will be risky. So funny, the human nature is we look for ways to take risk out of our lives, right? We're looking for stability, but then life's so boring. So what do we do? We fly to Las Vegas to get some excitement back in our life and, do, and gamble. You know, it's, life's too boring. Well, it's because you stripped all the risk out of it. Life was not meant to be like that. It, does, it doesn't have to be. It, it, God has an adventure for you. It will involve risk. You should feel a little bit every day like you're going to Las Vegas. You know, like, hey, this is a little risky. Good. Sounds like you're on the right track then. Because God wants you to live with some risk in your life. Is my commitment to Christ deep enough to cause me to risk anything? What are you willing to risk for? Because that... That is a direct connection to what you're willing to risk on how level your commitment is. How are you spending your time? How are you spending what God's given you and what even things you've worked for, your, your, your talents and the things and your gifts? How are you spending your money, you know, your tithe? Are you willing to commit some of that to God and say, God, I'm going to trust you with my finances? 
I'm going to trust you with my marriage, with my kids. I'm going to trust you with my health, with my retirement. I mean, I'm going to trust you, God, if you try to fit it all together and make it all organized and all boring, and there's no, it's nothing rooted in God, you got to come through. I love this verse here. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. That's hard to do. It's a lot easier to die for Jesus than it is to live for Jesus. Oh, I'll die for you. Yeah, but will you live for him? Will you live for him and just be a a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God? This is your spiritual worship, last verse. Only those who give their lives, Jesus says, away for my sake and the sake of the good news will ever know what it means to really live. Jesus defined it. You see, you're here for a purpose. And as, if you try to fill that purpose with something else, there will always be a mismatch. There will always be a hole. You'll never be fulfilled. There will be something missing, and you know it. And so God says, hey, listen, you've got to root your life in what really matters. You live for God. You live for the purpose that he has. You help spread the good news. You help. That, that's, that's what you're called to. God called you out of the darkness into the light. And God wants you to produce fruit. What is going to be the long-term effect of my life? In other words, ultimately, God wants us to have a view bigger than just this life, that you're looking for things to invest your life in things that matter. I want to close, uh, again, specifically for fathers. I, I, I have a Father's Day prayer based on what we just looked at in, in the Bible, based on Timothy's life, Epaphroditus' life. Here's this prayer. If this is your prayer, would you pray it right now as I read it? Just make it your prayer, Lord Help me to be a man who puts people before prophets. Who puts character before conformity. Who supports my Christian brothers rather than compete with them. Who puts the cause of Christ before comfort. And who puts service before security. That's my prayer for you. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? If you're online, just, would you just get in a spirit of prayerfulness right now? This is, a, this is actually arguably the most important part of the whole service when we invite the Holy Spirit to talk to us, to change lives, to make new commitments. Say, God, man, I need your help. We've looked at these different areas. I invited you to look at one or two of these areas that you said, I need to grow in this area. Certainly out of this list. There's one area or two that you could, you could up your game. And I'm going to invite you to do that. But it doesn't happen in your own strength. You've got to go to God. That's why we do this. This is why we close every weekend in prayer. Because we go, God, without you, nothing will change. But with you, all things are possible. And God says, it is possible when you look at that challenging situation. For some of you, fathers, You live with a fair amount of guilt for poor decisions. I want to tell you, God is here to say he wants you to not live with that guilt. He has created a pathway for you to live guilt-free. You go, yeah, but I deserve to feel guilty. Oh, you might. But that's not God's plan for you, and it's not God's purpose. He wants you to live without condemnation, without guilt. That's why he provided a way for you to live that way, a pathway. You go, what's that pathway, Andy? It's through prayer. It's through confession. And that hurts. Ouch, I don't like confession. Well, it's the pathway. It's the way God cleanses you. He says, come. God invites you. He says, come to me. God says, come, I want to cleanse you. But it happens through confession. So I'm going to invite you to do that right now. Just say, God, today... I want to confess those areas that I've dropped the ball. I have not been a person who's been very relational. I've withdrawn when I needed to be there. Say, God, I haven't always been the person demonstrating character and strength of, I don't care what other people think. Maybe somebody's told you you're a people pleaser. You know, we all have tendencies, and they can be good, and they can, they can have some negative consequences. So that's an area you say, God, I need to grow in that area. God doesn't want you to compete with other people. He wants you to cooperate. He wants you to discover teamwork. 
That's why we talk about small groups and growth track. We talk about this because these are, hey, let's do this together. We can't do this on our own. We need synergy. We need huge results. And so we need one another. Would you say, God, help me to have the strength of commitment in my life, to persevere when things are difficult, when I feel like giving up, when I want to make decisions that make my life more comfortable, but I know that's not what you have for me. Would you say, God, help me to grow in that area. And certainly, God, would you say, God, help me to put service before security, to be a risk taker, to step out in faith. Take that new job. Get married. Apologize. Risk taking a relationship that, or confront somebody. God says, I want you to be a person that has healthy relationships, that has a bigger view and sows into things that will really matter. If you've never put your faith in Christ, my friends, or maybe this is your moment. Maybe you're far from God. Maybe you've wandered off and God's calling you home and you know that. You didn't have to dial in and hear it online. You didn't have to have come here to hear it, but you know it's true. And this is your moment. You know, I believe there's key times in our lives and God is going to point those out to us when we go before him after we, when we die. He's going, to, he's going to point back to key moments. And some of you, this is a moment for you. He's going to point to this. You know, I didn't really understand it. I didn't really know what to do. I didn't really, you know, make that commitment. I, I didn't understand. I didn't know what you expected of me. And I, oh, yeah? And he'll point back to this moment. Well, yeah, you did. Listen. The most important decision you can make right now is making sure your life is right with God. Just inviting Christ into your life. It's that simple. Even children do it. Jesus invited children. And so this is your moment. It's just to, just to say yes to God. So if you're online, if you're with me right now, just in your heart, would you just open up and say, dear God, I want to follow you. I, want, I put my faith in the, what you did for me on the cross. And that you created a a pathway for me to no longer live with condemnation and guilt. You paid the price for anything I did wrong. My job is to follow you, to receive your gift of salvation. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm so proud.